Good evening. Can I give everyone a very warm welcome along to our service this evening? And it's great to see lots of visitors with us. You're especially welcome. Please do stay for tea and coffee afterwards, which will be served behind me in the lecture hall. You don't have to drink it there. You can take it into the coffee area if you want, but uh, we're hopefully going to see lots of people stay for coffee, so do uh, make your way there. Also, after this service, there'll be a time of prayer for those who are ill, and that will take place in the session room. So if you're staying for the time of prayer, that will be in the session room, and there'll probably still be tea and coffee after that. Let's turn our hearts to the worship of God. In Matthew's gospel and the 16th chapter, Jesus sets this challenge before his people, those who would be his disciples, he said. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We're going to praise God together as we sing our opening hymn, Be Still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here.
Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Father and God of heaven, we come before you this evening to worship you. We still our hearts. We quieten our minds, acknowledging that you are here. And where you are, there is blessing for your people. There is goodness, grace, and mercy in abundance in you. Your hands are open in generosity towards us. Your love poured out without limit. You are the God of all might and majesty. And of care and tenderness. You uphold the vastness of the heavens. They maintain their place at your command. And you're intimately, compassionately concerned for every detail of our lives. You love us. And should we ever question your love, you have confirmed it in that sacrificial self-giving of Jesus Christ. Your son sent to earth to see him. To seek us, to save us, and to claim us as your own. That we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. There is no merit in us, no worth of our own. It is all of Christ. And so we praise and adore him. And as we acknowledge your presence and we reflect on your goodness, we know that we are not good. Like Isaiah, we confess that we are people of sinful lips who live among people of sinful lips. And we are in distress in that moment until you come to us and cleanse us and wash us in you that we might stand not in our own merit, but in that achieved for us through Christ on Calvary's cross. In this is our hope. There we find our help. So, Lord, may we even now know the forgiveness of sins that are found in him. Find in walking with Jesus the strength for each day to serve you in this world, to make much of you. Bless and be with us now and all who share in this service. That our aim would ever be the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, the one through whom we pray. Amen. In our evening services, we're making our way through 2 Corinthians, and our focus will be on verses 1 to 13 of the 6th chapter this evening. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 1, and reminding ourselves as we do that this is God's word to us. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We are putting or we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed. A sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. 
We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our hearts wide open. You are not restricted by us. But you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I I speak to you as children. Widen your hearts also. And we ask that God would bless the reading of his word to your hearts and lives. James is going to share with us his spiritual journey. James. Um, I'm a Christian. I go here to, at Eden Dairy. Um, Robin's asked me, as he said, um, I'm going to share my testimony tonight. Um, and as Robin said, testimony is a spiritual journey. It's how someone finds faith, how they see God working in their life, you know, how they see themselves fitting into God's bigger story. Um, and I'd encourage you, um, to, just like me, the people over here who are getting uh, sort of inducted into membership tonight, also have these kind of stories. So come after the service and talk with them and let them share their faith with you as well. Um, so for me, um, I grew up here in Portadown, um, uh, born and bred, going to church. Um, I, you know, went every week. I prayed lots. I knew lots about the Bible. Um, I had all the liturgy memorized because I'm an Anglican. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I grew up thinking that all that stuff was how I got to heaven. Um, and uh, the, the, the real message of Jesus, you know, that um, to be saved is to believe in Jesus and the, the sacrifice and the resurrection, that never really pressed itself on my heart, you know, growing up. Um, when I got to 18, I did what many sort of stubborn hormone factories do. And um, <laughs> I sort of uh, moved out, right, and went to university to do a music degree. Um, and while I was there, you know, I drowned myself in sex and alcohol and strange philosophy and new ideology. Um, I identified as bisexual and then uh, pansexual non-binary. Um, and at, at sort of the peak of my sort of triumphal procession, I considered myself an anti-theist, which um, is not just somebody who does not believe in God, but somebody who wants to tear down religion on earth. Um, I thought I was taking control of my life. I thought I was becoming independent. Um, But the truth was I wasn't. Um, You know, the lives of all of the people around me were messy and dark. Um, I was developing a problem with alcohol. I developed an anxiety issue that I still battle today. I got depressed. I self-harmed. And then one day, um, someone very, very close to me did something very, very bad. And I went away to do another music degree. But this time... I wasn't moving out to take control. I was running away to hide. Um, that control that I thought I was getting, that I thought I could get, it was, it was gone. It wasn't there. The world was too big, too complicated, too uncontrollable. So doing a degree that I didn't want to do, living alone, um, that alcohol problem got much worse. That depression got much worse until um, I became suicidal. Um, I remember sitting one day in a pub in Belfast thinking, you know, like, if we are all just empty space and and, and matter floating around in gravity, like, what's the point? Like, really, what's the point? Why love or try or do exams or obey laws or do anything? You know, there's no point. And so I fled from that, and I thought I'd find the answer in Buddhism. I thought I'd find it in reading tarot cards. Uh, And I found real power there in those things, but it was the wrong power, you know? It didn't... It wasn't doing what I thought it would do. Um, Then uh, one night I was sitting in my university building at Queen's. Um, It was late at night and I was afraid to walk home because I thought I might do something stupid. And um, a girl called Madeline McDowell turned the corner. Uh, She came, she noticed me. She came and sat beside me and um, she started talking to me, and she, she revealed that she was a Christian, and of course, all the usual objections rose up in me, right? I'm ready for a fight here, you know, the anti-theist at play. Um, but as we talked, I, the bizarre thing was, I kind of realized that those things weren't there. That animosity, that fight was gone. Um, all I felt was her warmth and my desperation. Um, so she kept chatting to me about her faith, and then she invited me, um, she, she asked me if I'd like to go to 
the Queen's Mission Week, which just happened to be starting the next day. And the bizarre thing was that I realized that I did for some reason. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Mission Week at Queen's is a week, usually January, February time, where they get a speaker or two to come over and do like a week of events talking about Jesus and Christianity. Um, and anyone can come, anyone can listen, anyone can ask questions and talk about Jesus. Um, so I went with Madeline. Madeline introduced me to all of her friends. She had so many friends, Madeline, all these new people. And they were all like her. They had this sort of, this warmth, this sort of otherness, kindness that I, I couldn't quite place, you know. Um, and they wanted to get to know me. They wanted to listen to me. They wanted to help me. Um, and the speaker for that week um, was a man called D.A. Carson. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, the bizarre thing is he just happens to be one of the probably the most well-respected, talented, uh, persuasive theologians of our time in the world. Um, I got to hear him speak about God and science. I got to hear him expound the raising of Lazarus. Um, and at the end of that week, um, I was hooked on something. I didn't know what it was. Um, so a few months went by of me being invited to prayer meetings, going to scripture union, um, spending many very late nights debating with very loving people about God and challenging them and arguing with them. Um, but the bizarre thing was I was getting better. Um, I was seeing what seemed to be the best therapist in Belfast and my depression was lifting like that, you know? That control that alcohol seemed to have on me was gone without reason. Um, I felt no desire to sleep with a man anymore. I wanted to live, not die. Um, so 12th of April, rocks around, almost a week, over a week before Easter, um, and I'm sitting in a practice room at Queen's, right, with a there's piano in front of me, I'm improvising, windows open, it's lovely, bright sunny day, um, and I'm trying to clear my head, right, because I've got all of these ideas, there's so much going on, pain around me, struggle inside, I'm confused, I don't know what's going on, and this one thought keeps bumping into my consciousness, and it won't go away, and it says, God, God, God. And so I, I confront him, I say, what do you want? And he said, I want you. And in that moment, I knew God. I could see his reality, his power, his love. Um, and I could see myself too. I could see all of the evil, evil things that I had said and thought and done. Um, and I knew that those things needed to be punished if, if things were just, you know, if justice was a real thing. But God told me that um, if I believed in Jesus, if I believed in what he did on the cross, dying for our sins, taking that punishment, then I'd be forgiven um, and that I would, uh, I would get to go and live with him in eternal life. Um, and from that moment on, things changed. You know, the bizarre thing was I needed to read the Bible. Um, all those, like, liturgy passages that I had memorized back in the Anglican Church, they weren't just, like, a mark of pride now. They were this beautiful way of illuminating God, like a tapestry almost, you know? Um, I was a different person. Um, and I've been doing that ever since. I've been walking with Jesus, I've been learning from him, being loved by him, being disciplined by him, making music with him, having a relationship with him. And I know that there are people in this room and online tonight who don't have that relationship with Jesus. Um, maybe you think that you're doing all the right things and you're gonna get to heaven. Maybe you think you're taking control or maybe you're just doing whatever you want or maybe you even just worship something or someone completely foreign. Um, I promise you, you can have a real relationship with God. Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that who would ever believe in him would not die but have eternal life. If, if, if I, if we, if you believe in Jesus, in his death and resurrection, and then he took the punishment for your sin, you can have that relationship too. So I'm gonna pray a wee prayer now. Um, and just so that no one's confused, praying does not mean 
you know, close your eyes, bow your head, put your hands together, do the hokey cokey, right? It means that you're talking to a God who's listening. And, and whether you speak into your heart or you shout it from the rooftops, he's going to hear. Um, and if you have been thinking about this forever or if something's just occurred to you now and you think you can, please pray this prayer into yourself with me now, okay? Lord Jesus, I believe that you died an innocent man to take the punishment for all the evil things that I have done. I want to leave those evil things behind and live for you instead. I love you, Lord Jesus. Please save me. In your precious name, amen. Thank you. We're going to sing in Christ alone.
evening in our service. We are receiving new members. I want to express my thanks to Daniel for helping this. Uh, he led our first two sessions, which showed you how the record was. We went through our membership classes, and it's taken until tonight to get organized to, to welcome our members uh, into fellowship. Can I invite the, the members, please, to come to the front? I invite the congregation to stand with them. Somewhere along there, anyone? Anyway. <coughs> My friends. In membership, you have already been received into the fellowship of Christ. You are recognized as members of the family and the household of God. Now you come to profess your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to set yourself apart for him. Accepting both the privileges and the responsibilities of membership of his church and acknowledging your receipt of gifts and the strengthening power of the Holy Spirit. So in the name and by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sole King and Head of the Church, I ask you now to make profession of your faith and to answer the following four questions. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit? And do you trust in Jesus Christ alone as your saviour from sin and as Lord of your life? Do you promise to live as a follower of Jesus Christ, led and empowered by the Holy Spirit? Finally, do you, as a member of this congregation, commit to worship, serve, give and participate fully in its life and witness? May God bless you as you seek to Keep these promises made in his presence this evening. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for the folk that we have seen stand at the front of our congregation this evening. We thank you for your work in their hearts, some a long time ago, some more recently, turning their steps to follow after you, strengthening them for the task of serving you and saving their soul. We thank you for the love that you've set upon them, Lord, before time began that even tonight has come to fruition in this step they've taken into membership in our fellowship. Lord, may they know blessing here. May they sense the love of your people in this place. May they feel that they are highly valued for themselves and for the gifts that you have given to them. And may we together encourage them in their walk with you and Help to guard them against the evils of this world. Lord, may they use their gifts to serve you, their lives to bear testimony to you. And may they know day by day your love upon them to sustain and care for them. Lord, we pray that our church together as a family might make much of Jesus in this place. And from here to the ends of the earth as you would guide and lead each of us in your mission and ministry. So bless these folk, we ask and pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. It's warm here this evening, maybe it's just me, but uh, we're turn, turning to God's Word. And those verses that I read uh, with you from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I just want to look at... Three very simple points this evening from these verses. Three simple points. The first is opportunities to be claimed, obstacles to be cleared, and open hearts to be cleansed. Opportunities to be claimed, obstacles to be cleared, and open hearts to be cleansed. Opportunities to be claimed. 
It's a very long time ago, but a small group of prisoners used to meet weekly in the Mays prison for a Bible study. And on one particular day, one particular meeting, the minister who was leading that group urged some of those who were unsaved to give their lives to Jesus to commit their lives to Christ. And he concluded his, his little message with these words. He said to them, you may not get another opportunity. You don't know where you're going to be this time next week. But most of these men were lifers. And in their minds, they were going nowhere. And they knew exactly where they were going to be next week. And so they laughed and they mocked. The minister's heart felt pleading. However, one of the men in that group was released that weekend on parole. And the next week, as he was taking his little boy to, to primary school, a motorcycle pulled up alongside him and the pillion passenger shot and killed him. The next week, that group met for Bible study. And it was with a somber mood that they reflected on the empty chair in their midst. An opportunity had been presented to them. The day of salvation was opened up before them. But for this one man, it had passed. Paul writes to us here, verses 1 and 2 of this sixth chapter, saying, Working together with him... Then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It is no easy, no straightforward thing to live in the present. To be able to focus on this time and this place. And perhaps there is nowhere where that is most noticed than in the middle of a sermon on a Sunday evening service. So often, is it not the truth that, that our minds are maybe cast back on, on what has passed? And we're thinking, uh, remembering with either rejoicing or regret at, at some of the things that we've done. Or maybe we're, we're thinking of the future and we're, we're dreaming or we're dreading what is yet to be. But the present is the only time that has guaranteed us. It's the only time that we have. This is the moment in which we are called to live. And Paul says to the Corinthians, he says to us tonight, carpe diem, seize the day, grasp this amazing opportunity that is provided for you. Gain this abundant and eternal life made available through Jesus Christ as he is presented to you in the gospel. When I was in my late teens, my aunt and uncle, who throughout my life were incredibly generous to me. They gave me a money belt for my birthday. A blue nylon money belt. I don't know if I remember these things just to be about. And I, had, I was a teenager. I, I, I had an image to maintain. And the thought of ever wearing this blue nylon money belt was, was just a... Ridiculous, so I stuck it away in a cupboard and thought no more about it for more than 20 years. And when I finally found it again, I noticed what I hadn't seen before, that there was a bulge in this money belt. And when I finally opened it, I realized there was a very generous financial gift contained therein. And how foolish was I to cast aside a generous gift, to treat it with contempt. And that's a small, insignificant illustration of what the apostle here means when he says to receive the grace of God in vain. 
to have this precious possession made available to you and to feel, to avail of it and to recognize its worth. A wonderful gift is given freely, available. And you ought to have claimed it and benefited from the blessings that it brings. But Paul says it's possible to toss it aside, to count it as worthless. He says here there are opportunities to be claimed. Now is the day of salvation. This time is all that you have. Opportunities to be claimed and obstacles to be cleared. Verse 3, he claims with a clear conscience that we, Paul's ministry team, put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. So for you, those of you who were here last Sunday night, we were thinking about Paul's great passion for the ministry of reconciliation. To see sinners and a holy God brought into a right relationship. And his desire is that he in no way would be a stumbling block to anyone on that journey. And I'm sure you've heard that argument being used. That very example. Someone will say, well, you know, if such and such calls himself a Christian, I would never want to be one of those. And the truth is, sadly, we who profess faith in Christ are very frequently the cause of others turning from him. New Testament scholar Murray Harris has written, it's always true that the life of the Christian is the most eloquent advertisement for the gospel. And may it be so, may we live in such a way as we make much of Jesus in our day. But Paul here is particularly aware of the the challenges as a, a preacher of the gospel, as a minister of the gospel, that there is great potential to do harm to its message. He writes elsewhere to Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, and he, speaking of those in leadership, he says, the, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. Above reproach. This requirement for elders does not mean that they are to be perfect or sinless, in which case there would be no elders either teaching or ruling elders. But but this is a helpful way to think about what it means to be above reproach. Think of it like this. If your work colleagues or if your neighbors heard that you were an elder in the local church, would they be surprised? Paul's argument is that they ought not to be. You should live before them as an example of godliness. John MacArthur comments, a minister is not commended by his seminary degree, theology, popularity, personality, or success. His life is the only letter of commendation that matters, the only one that people will read. Sadly, and all too quickly, we could together compile a list of of those who have brought reproach to the gospel by their conduct, those who are are leaders in the church who have failed and fallen. Not a month goes by without a new story to add to that catalog. And while there may be many different responses to such tragedy, above all, they should stir us to pray. To pray for the one who has sinned that the Lord would work in his heart to restore him. And to pray for those who have been harmed because inevitably there will be casualties in such tragic circumstances. And to pray for yourself that you would be strengthened to stand firm in these evil days and not fall into the same traps. 
The godly minister Robert Murray McShane of uh, generations ago wrote these words. He said, the falls of Christians into sin make me tremble. I have been driven away from prayer and burdened in a fearful manner by hearing or seeing their sin. This is wrong. It is right to tremble. And to make every sin of every Christian a lesson of my own helplessness. But it should lead me the more to Christ. So how does Paul then ensure that he and his ministry team are not placing stumbling blocks in the ways of others? He begins to catalog this, this long list of all that he's experienced in the ministry he's engaged in to date. In his Proclamation of the gospel, he lists problems, privileges, and paradoxes. If you look down at verses 4 and 5, you'll see the problems. There he writes of what Chrysostom, the great 4th century preacher, called a, a blizzard of troubles. He collates the following. He says, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. These problems that Paul lists, he holds up as his credential, the necessary proof of his right to be heard as he shares the good news of the gospel. A little bit reminiscent of Ernest Shackleton's infamous advertisement which probably didn't appear in any newspaper but makes a great sermon illustration. Shackleton's advert supposedly read, men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in event of success. In the very same way, the call of Christ is a call to pay a high price. We read those words of Jesus at the start of our service together, Matthew 16, when he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This was Paul's passionate pursuit to give his life away for the cause of Jesus Christ. He, he, he didn't care what the cost would be. He made this very clear to the Philippians. Philippians 3.10, he explains that the logging of his heart was that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death. Now, Paul was not a masochist who enjoyed the pain that these problems provoked. But he understood that to live faithfully for Jesus Christ in this world would be to pay a high cost. The Lord had already made that very clear to him as Ananias, sent by God, came to him to explain, Acts 9, 16, that I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So it was said of Paul that everywhere he went, there was either a riot or revival. The preaching of the gospel through this servant of Christ always precipitated a strong reaction. There were problems and there were privileges. Ministry wasn't only just an endurance test. Look at 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7. He says, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the, for the left. How could Paul, how could Paul endure such hardship? Quite simply, he was impelled along by the Spirit of God. And the fruit of that indwelling spirit was clearly on display for all to see. He doesn't take credit for these qualities. He's not wanting attention for himself. But he's highlighting the power of God at work within him and through him. He wants his readers to understand that his life is expended for Christ as it is empowered by Christ through the Spirit. Problems, privileges, paradoxes. 
verses 8 to 10. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not skilled, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. This paradoxical Christian life, we we see it over and over in the book of Psalms, where we discover that there are these songs of despair that, that end in a wonderful chorus of delight. Why? Because the psalmist sets out seeing the world with all its problems, but then he lifts his eyes to see the Lord and his heart is stirred to worship. God is on the throne and all is right, even in the midst of the trial and turmoil he experiences. And that's Paul's testimony. Philip Hughes comments, But no sorrow, no disappointment, however severe, could ever interrupt, let alone extinguish, the joy of his salvation with its vision of unclouded glory to come. For this joy was founded upon the sovereign supremacy of God who overrules all things and causes them to work together for the good of those he has called. Last Thursday afternoon I had coffee with a young man who's contemplating entering into ministry. And what am I to say in such situations? Am I there to to sell ministry, to speak about the good salary, the excellent pension scheme, and the good job security? No. I speak of the paradox, of the the unrivaled privilege of being allowed to preach the Word of God and to share in and to care for the lives of people. And I speak of the problems. I make it clear that in ministry there are many headaches and heartaches. There is no better way in which to expand your life. But I always add, if you think you can find a better way to live, by all means pursue that career. And it's great to know that in the sovereignty of God, I can never get it wrong. No one can escape his call. He he draws his own irresistibly to himself. If he commissions someone to service, they will serve him. Just ask Jonah. Opportunities to be claimed, obstacles to be cleared, and open hearts to be cleansed. Paul wears his heart on his sleeve. He loves the people of Corinth. He holds nothing back from them. The question is, would they respond? Would they reciprocate his love? Would they love him in return? In chapter 7, verse 2, he adds, he says, Make room in your hearts for us. When I ask my grandson Jack, how much He loves his granddad, and I suggest, arms open wide, that it ought to be this much. He will say, this much, finger and thumb barely apart. And then he'll add, we joke. That child is spending too much time with his grandmother. And Paul stretches his arms open wide, and he testifies that he loves the Christians in Corinth this much. He loves them this much because this is how he has first been loved by his Savior, Jesus Christ. Tozer, A.W. Tozer has written that love is a transforming power. He states, we are becoming what we love. We are to a large degree the sum of our love. And we will grow into the image of what we love most. For love is, among other things, a creative affinity. It changes and molds and shapes and transforms. And the Lord is ever looking to do heart surgery in the lives of his people. 
He wants to cut away those lesser loves that ought not to be and to fill your heart with the greatest love. That is, love with all you are for God and love for your neighbor as yourself. And he says, Paul says, that if you love Jesus, you will love like Jesus. You will love his people with an extravagant love, with a love that has no exception. And Paul, in loving Jesus, has a heart like his. His heart is filled with love for this Corinthian church. And he asks of them, has Christ come to transform their hearts and to fill them with love? Is it evident to the world that they love as Jesus first loved them? Many years ago, there was a Presbyterian minister called James Bryan. Throughout the whole community, he was known as Brother Bryan. And there were many, many preachers in that region who were far more competent orators. But none of them preached better sermons with their lives than Brian. It was a very common thing for him to come home after being out visiting on a very cold day to be without an overcoat because he would have passed a poor man with none and would have given it away. On one spring day, he was out driving his horse and buggy in the country, and he saw a farmer standing in tears in the middle of a field. The only horse that the farmer had had died, and it was plowing season. So Brother Brian unhitched his horse, gave it to the man, and walked home. And when they came to write the biography of this man, it was written and called a sermon in shoes. This is how Paul lived his life. A life of sacrifice and service. A life compelled by the love that Jesus Christ first had for him. He, the chief of sinners, was loved by the sinless Son of God. And it was a, a life that caused others to contemplate the call of Christ in their hearts. Sam Storms asks this question. He says, when people look at you, does God look good? Does the love that pours from your life cause people to consider this Savior Jesus Christ who first put that love there. Opportunities to be claimed. Have you claimed the gift of salvation? There are obstacles to be cleared. Are you sure you're not putting obstacles in the way of others by the way you live your life? And there are open hearts to be cleared. Has the love of Christ overwhelmed you? So that you love others just as he first loved you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the love that you have shown to us in Jesus. A love that we could never deserve and yet is so freely poured out upon us. May we open our hearts to receive it. And then open the wider to let it flow from us to this needy world. May Jesus Christ be evident in our midst by the way in which we treat each other, by the love that we share and the things that we do. Lord, may we corporately as a church and individually as Christians make much of Jesus, make God look good so that he may be glorified in our lives and each and every day. We ask and pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing to God's praise again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Continue our worship as we bring our evening offering to God. We bring our prayers to God for others. Let's pray together. Lord, as we worship you this evening, we hold nothing back from you. You've given yourself for us, and we must reciprocate in 
sacrificial self-giving to the cause of your glory and the honor of your name. Lord, take our lives in every part, not just the money that we set aside, but our time and our energy, desiring that your kingdom would be extended and your name uplifted. Lord, we understand this world needs Jesus. We pray that you would equip and enable all those who love you to make you known in everything they say and do and every day you give. Build your church as you have promised. Build it in this place, life upon life, soul after soul, called to your side. And mature us in faith that we might more and more resemble our Savior in all that we do and say. Father, we thank you for the activities in the life of our congregation that continue day by day. We pray that you would encourage us and motivate us to greater acts of service for your kingdom. Lord, be with those who need your help and healing, those who need your comfort and your care, your guarding and your guiding, your saving touch. Work in our needy world, Lord, bring wars to seek. Bring unity among divided peoples and turn lives to you. Hear the prayers that we present now through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing our closing praise, Christ our hope in life and death, and thank our new members for leading us in worship and thanking them for choosing the pieces we have sung this evening.
grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all this night and forevermore. Amen.